So I'm Dr. Steven Novella. I am the host and producer of the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe podcast. I'm also a clinical neurologist at Yale University, and I author a couple of blogs and recently the author of a book called The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. So I think you know, any of the big topics of futurology, if you're talking about what, what the future going to be like in terms of artificial intelligence, genetic manipulation, uh, stem cells and biology, uh, you know, and physics, et cetera, they, they all have a certain degree of legitimacy, of course, but it's nearly impossible to really project technology into the future. Um, except in the broadest brushstrokes. So they all also have their hype, I think. Probably the one uh, that I think where the hype is really outstripping the reality is in nanotechnology. Now, I, I'm a believer that you know nanotechnology has the potential to be very powerful. We're already using it. We're, we're, we're manufacturing materials on the nanoscale. Uh, but the idea that we're going to anytime soon you know, have nanoscale machines that are going to be doing sophisticated things like making us immortal, you know, for example, like reversing all aging, uh, et cetera, or that we're going to be able to turn a rubber tire into a steak just with nano machines. I think that that hype is so extreme that we may never realize that level, uh, at least not in anything that we can project. Uh, but I do think that there's a lot, there is some low hanging fruit that, you know, nanotechnology will achieve. I think like, Crawling through your arteries, eating up cholesterol, sure, that's a pretty straightforward thing that I could see nanomachines doing, uh, for example. But, you know, completely repairing your cells, again, there's nothing impossible about those things, but um, not being impossible is a pretty low bar. <laughs> you know, the, I think in addition to being not impossible, it has to be practical and uh, it, it, it's just, you know, we, we, the history has been that we always run into problems we didn't anticipate with any technology. Sometimes those problems put off the technology for a decade, sometimes for a century, sometimes indefinitely. Um, and so I think nanotechnology, when we really, really try to manipulate the world at the nanoscale with tiny machines, we're going to run into all kinds of problems that are going to take much longer to solve than we, I think the optimists are anticipating. The way in which people try and assess whether a technology is, is near, is like in the singularity is near, for instance, the book by Ray Kurzweil is by curve fitting previous trends in technology. Does that work? So projecting current technological trends into the future is extremely problematic. And we can tell from history that, again, other than the broadest brushstrokes of technologies going to advance, uh, I, we can't really say, we can't do that extrapolation. Um, like, for example, if you looked at you know, hydrogen fuel cell technology 30 years ago. I think everyone imagined that we would be in a much different place than we are today. Everyone got it wrong. Everyone. Why was that? Because they were extrapolating. They were saying, okay, it's, if it continues to improve at the rate that it is, this is where we should be in 2000, 2010, 2020. The problem is it didn't continue to progress as it was because we ran into roadblocks like, oh, it turns out it's really hard to store a lot of hydrogen in a way that's safe and won't blow up when you crash but also has good you know, weight to energy ratio and can be released fast enough to run a car. Like all those things, those were non-trivial problems that we're still trying to sort out and that really slowed down the application of that technology you know, beyond everyone's, I think, extrapolation. Or, you know, the, 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 of course, the, the, the famous ones are, we still don't have jetpacks and flying cars, right? Where we, we sort of do, but like, no, we're not flying around in flying cars because there are some physics problems that, are hard to get around, and you can't just extrapolate linearly you know, our technological progress that doesn't necessarily solve problems that will get in our way. Sometimes, the, and sometimes those problems are the laws of physics. So I think it's naive. I think it's naive to extrapolate anything in a consistent linear way into the future. Like this is also the flip side of this is peak whatever. Like, oh, we're passing peak oil or peak anything. That's also, those are linear extrapolations. It, they don't work. Um, so in, it doesn't work in a good way, but it also doesn't work in a bad way. We can't make a linear extrapolation of technology either. Yeah, so what are the critical thinking tools that are most applicable to thinking about the future? I think the first one is humility, right? Just to acknowledge what we don't know. We, we, predicting that we've been horrible at predicting the future so far. Why would that suddenly change, right? Why would we suddenly get so much better at predicting the future than we've ever been? Um, you know, no one would have anticipated 
uh, really the smartphone. Um, if you look at movies in the 1990s, they thought that our phones would get smaller and smaller and smaller because that was a linear progression of the current trends. It turns out we started going the other way because people decided they wanted more screen time, you know, real estate, not just smaller phones, for example. Uh, so I think humility is the big one. Um, and then, you know, I think also it's good to step back and, and say, well, how, what is uh, the history of, future, of the future, right? The history of futurology. How has it worked? What mistakes did we tend to make? We're probably going to continue to make those mistakes, if, at least if we don't carefully think about it. Like, for example, uh, people in general, when they are imagining what the future is going to be like, they tend to massively overestimate short-term progress, but they tend to underestimate long-term progress. Again, because th th things don't progress in a linear fashion. Um, they can sometimes become geometric, which means it might be slower at first, but then really speed up, or they don't anticipate game-changing technology, because again, they're just trying to extrapolate from where we are. The, the really big game-changers cha sometimes you know, sort of hit us out of left field, and so um, it changes the game, right? We may be extrapolating the current game into the future, but we don't know what all the game-changers are gonna be. So, uh, you know, I think to be a student of history and be humble. I think those are the most important things. And just to just to acknowledge the fact that no, we don't really know. We're we're bad at predict we're at predicting the future. That's the bottom line. Excellent. Yeah. Well, um, with your neuroscience background, well, let's talk about AI then. Um, also, because yep. I think that's a pretty seems like it's a, a pretty powerful technology today. Um, but also, it looks as though it could get even more powerful in the future, depending on the right discoveries being made. Um, what are your general feelings about the future of artificial intelligence? I've thought a lot about the future of artificial intelligence. It's a powerful technology, and it, it is continuing to advance, and it's, it's changing our lives right now. Uh, but. But AI, you know, artificial intelligence is, um, there's multiple aspects to it. It's not just a GI, artificial general intelligence, what, what people would you know, usually think of as a self-aware machine. It's not just that. It's things like deep learning, right, which deep learning has been doing, you know, fantastic things. Um, but, and, and there's many other aspects to it as well. So you really have to look at the specific kinds of things that were, is under the umbrella of AI and how they, we are using those as tools to tackle specific problems. Um, I think that those things are progressing really fast and they're gonna continue to probably, maybe even get faster. But if we talk about like specifically what's gonna happen, I don't think we know. Um, so in my thinking, about, I'm always thinking about like, all right, what is likely to happen in the future and it's been constantly changing as new things happen because I was not good at predicting like where we would be uh, with that. So like, for example, one of the, if I think of like what I thought 10 years ago versus what I think now, 10 years ago I thought that, yeah, we would, you know, we're making a beeline towards AGI and that's what we're gonna need to do in order to have all the really cool applications of AI. But it turns out non-AGI, sort of more narrowly focused AI is a lot more capable than I thought. Um, I think maybe a lot more capable than many people thought. Maybe the experts in the field were you know, ahead of the curve on that, at least the public perception. But sort of as an interested non-expert, you know, we've accomplished a lot more. So then my thinking was shifting towards, well, maybe, who knows, maybe we'll be able to do everything we want without AGI. Just, just narrow AI could do whatever it is that we want to do. And we won't ever have to, you know, just for practical application purposes, develop AGI. Um, we probably still will want to do that anyway, just for research purposes, just to do it. And um, so I, I do think that, well, you know, to me, it seems like the shortest, most direct path to AGI is going to be duplicating the brain, not building it from the bottom up from first principles, because uh, we're not really headed in that direction. But we are trying to reverse engineer the brain. And I think if we completely successfully reverse engineer the brain, we'll have an artificial brain you know, at the end of that road. And so that's probably how we'll get there the quickest. Again, the, with all humility, I really don't know, but that would be my guess if I had to guess right now. And I think in parallel to that, we're developing neural networks, and I think we're showing, like, we still are trying to figure out what they're best for. We're developing quantum computing, which I don't think is really on the path to AI, but who knows how that's gonna, when we really like more fully realize quantum computing, maybe that will play a role in AI, and that will be a curveball that you know, will throw all of our predictions off. Uh, we'll see how far we can get with deep learning. We're kind of in the hype phase right now, but I think there's probably going to be a post-hype phase where we start to discover the limitations 
of deep learning. It's not going to solve all problems. I don't think anybody thinks it does, you know, in the, who, who are experts in the field. So it's, kind of, it's, it's really complicated. I'm more like, you know, I am thinking about the future, but I'm also just watching what's happening with fascination. And I'm sort of changing my mind all the time as new things happen, because it, it's, so far it's been pretty surprising. Indeed. Even Demis Hassabis from Deep Mind, who's like the guy, one of the founders with Shane Lee, said that deep, like this deep learning phase isn't going to do everything. Right. Um, one of the earlier uh, sort of promulgators of deep learning, Joshua Benigo, if I'm saying his name correctly, I don't know if I am, and another earlier Bayesian, that guy, they both saying, okay, well, and I kind of agree, is that um, deep learning is very much about curve fitting, about correlational stuff, and correlation is in causation, and it could be very much the case what we really need in AI is causation, and that's what we're going to be working on. Well, that's what the, the needs to be worked on next. And, and two really big AI guys are focusing on that right now and think that it could be here in the next five, ten years. Mm -hmm. Have you um, heard anything about that? Yeah, so uh, AI specialist, again, I'm a non-expert. I'm looking on the sidelines as a very interested science communicator who's interested in this, who's been reading about it my whole life. And from what I'm gleaning, so yeah, deep learning is massively successful, but is not going to solve all problems. I don't think anybody thinks that it is. So now we're the, the experts are working on a couple of things from what I'm reading. One is... All right, so how do we build in some kind of motivation, like the, you know, making the computer algorithms trying to work towards a goal uh, rather than just telling them what to do? We sort of make them more goal-oriented. Uh, and, and another thing um, you know, that, that we're working on, uh, again, I, I have no idea you know, how it's going, um, is trying to figure out, like giving the computer some kind of knowledge, if you will, about cause and effect, or like being able to generalize from specific examples. So not just seeing the patterns in the data. It's really good at that, really good at crunching a lot of data and seeing more and more sophisticated patterns, developing more and more sophisticated algorithms from those patterns by, you know, computers are now sort of talking to each other to try to learn how to do things uh, and just running simulations, talking to themselves, you know, they able to like beat the best Go champion in the world, that's fantastic. But if we're going to break out of that, we have to sort of add other things to the mix. And so what are those other things and how are they going to play out? This is where I actually also get a little bit worried because now we're sort of breaking out into more open-ended things. And I think having really powerful systems that are more open-ended in terms of what they're going to do will be powerful, but I think we, you know, we have to make sure that we're keeping it on rails the whole, the whole way because even without malevolent intent or self-awareness, there could be unintended consequences, you know, because it, we are sort of sort of setting these processes free to some extent. So it's both exciting and scary at the same time. Yeah, like the, the genie that gives Midas the ability to turn anything into gold, the perverse instantiation <laughs> of his wishes. Right, you know, right, uh, right. It, whether the genie meant it or not, um, this is something AI could unintentionally perversely right. instantiate what our wishes are. Right, exactly. And so the, the unintended consequences may not be something to worry about if you're just talking about a research lab, you know. But when we start to put our financial system, you know, in the hands of these systems and we think that we understand how they're going to behave, but we don't, maybe we don't fully understand how they're going to behave, you know, we, we by definition can't predict the outcomes. There's a, a flip side to that, and that is um, if we have systems that don't understand what we actually mean, we may give them a very malformed command, um, mm -hmm. and without the system's ability to understand the context or um, have the motivation to query it back and say, is this what you mean, mm -hmm. um, could implement something really disastrous, or if we have a very unwise wish, it could be like, yeah, yeah, yeah I couldn't step in without, like, some form of understanding of context to, um, yeah, to stop bad things from happening. Yeah. And so AI is a very powerful tool. And right now, that's what it is, right? It's not deciding what to do, per se. We're just, it's a tool that we're using to do what we want it to do. But as we build more and more functionality into it, that line may blur. And when the AI is determining um, maybe how it's going to achieve the goals that we're setting before it, that is, a, that is something that may be out of our control and may decide to achieve it in a way that we didn't anticipate. It may be the most efficient way from the machine's perspective, from the algorithms that we're, we're building into it, but it may not be a way that we would have wanted it to go about it. Or if we give it more um, 
the more and more general we can make those directions, the more and more latitude or degrees of freedom the AI has in its, in its behavior, the less predictable it's going to be. And I think part of that is, um, <clears throat> in a way, it's like if you have children, children ask questions that are really fascinating because they're not, they don't have all of the, the background and context and assumptions that we have. And so they ask questions that like really challenge our assumptions about things because we didn't realize we were making them. And uh, the, like the first AIs may be like children in that they may challenge assumptions we don't know we're making. And that's where the unintended consequences are going to come in. And of course, you can't, by definition, you can't anticipate those. What can AI learn from neuroscience? <coughs> um, I think AI and neuroscience are learning from each other right now. And they're, they're feeding off of each other. So um, artificial intelligence can learn from biological intelligence because uh, it's, you know, millions of years of evolution has able, been able to tinker and create a very sophisticated, you know, art, intelligent machines. So there's clearly a lot to learn from that. Um, but also we can use AI to test our theories about how the brain is working. And we can model the brain in silicon and then test it and see how it works. And so the more we learn about the brain, the more we could use that to develop AI. And the, the more sophisticated our, our AI, the more we can use that to test our understanding of the brain. So I, th I see these as running in parallel and supporting each other. That's why I think that they're basically going to bootstrap each other until we get to an artificial brain. I think that's likely how it's going to play out. Again, with all due humility, we don't really know. But that, that's what I would guess if I had to say for that very reason. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just in concluding then, um, what do you, if you were to like put your crystal ball on and, and make a, you know, a bold prediction about the next like 10 to 15 years, where do you think we'll be at with AI? Yeah, so making just a bold, carefree prediction of where AI is going to be in, in 10 to 15 years, I think we'll probably by that time see like really mature deep learning, but also really starting to push up against the limitations of deep learning. And I, I suspect there's going to be some new approaches that I don't really know what they would be, but I think they're going to involve expanding the, again, the degrees of freedom of AI. We'll see what, the, what whatever that's called. Uh, those are the probably the things that AI researchers are just thinking of right now. You know, they'll, they'll be realized in 10 to 15 years. Um, so I'm always trying to keep an eye out for like what's because it's hard because probably for every hundred news items that we read and, and think about and discuss about what might like some new baby step technology that that they're developing, maybe only one actually pans out. Most of them don't go anywhere. So it's really hard to say what's the one that's going to change the world versus just be a curiosity. So I think that's as far as I'd be willing to go. Fantastic. Well, it's been wonderful having you. Cheers. Okay. Thank you.